we talked about the mechanics of these methods earlier in the week, but this presentation came from a class I gave where they said, all right, John, we understand the mechanics. How do we implement it? And ended up turning into this presentation. There's a lot more to a successful application than just knowing what the steps are and knowing the terminology. These are the bullets I want to tackle. You've got to get buy-in before you can do anything usually. How do you craft that argument? You've got to learn the method. You've got to select the right system to, for STPA to work. There have been cases where people apply it to the wrong system and then wonder why it didn't work as well as everyone else has found. You've got to assemble the right team. Lots of cases with folks having the wrong team. You've got to plan the project. Again, cases where people skip this planning and just dive right in. Now, I don't want to discourage you. There's a lot of value from just diving right in, but if lives are on the line, you've really got to do this right. How do you guide the analysis as a facilitator? What do you need from management to make this work? And some data that I've collected from facilitating this in industry. All right, so first, you've got to get buy-in. Uh, most folks are in a situation, can see the value now, can see where this might be applied but it's not enough just to have one person rooting for this. You need some motivation as an organization. So think about recent loss events, incidents. That's one way to build motivation. These are teachable moments. I mean, the cause is not just the operator forgot to put in uh, X or, or forgot to take X action. So part of the reason for incidents is the methods we used uh, beforehand. And uh, you might it might be worth exploring the question, would SDPA have helped? Um, especially if there's a recent event, if it's getting a lot of attention in your organization, that's one place that people have started. Uh, what about recalls, warranty issues, serviceability issues, where it wasn't maybe a super serious uh, event that made national headlines, but something that's locally important to you. You may be able to estimate the cost to fix. Companies ha usually have these calculations already of a dollar value that they're spending on these things uh, found late. And then well, how does that compare to the cost to perform SDPA? Now, I can't give you a fixed number to perform SDPA. I know you'd all love to have that, but it's it's not in the millions for sure. It's it's much, much less than that. So if you get a cost to fix these things later that you're already paying for in the millions or the billions, which are real numbers other companies have found, and if these are things that SDPA really would have found, it's a no-brainer what you need to do. So that's one way to come up with a, a motivation for this or see if there is motivation. Another way is if you can't get a serious investment to do SDPA, you can start small. N equals one is good enough to start. Now, it's not good enough... I think when lives are on the line, but it's a lot better than nothing. And it's a good enough place to start exploring um, SDPA to ferret out what are the advantages and how do I make this argument. Start with a small application, build evidence incrementally. Um, so have one person spend a few days. Now you've really got to know SDPA pretty well to only uh, require a few days to build evidence, but start small, start building evidence and, and use that as motivation to get an investment in something larger and then keep going. It snowballs from there. Another way to go about this is a cost benefit or a return on investment argument. There are two ways to build a cost benefit argument or a return on investment argument. You can do this from public data. There is some public uh, literature in the academic community on the uh, amount of, Bill Young showed one slide with one reference, there are others. This shows the cost of catching things later, and it shows the, the biggest cost drivers. Bumper sticker there is we need to make the right decision early. It's always much ex more expensive to fix these decisions late. But there is quantitative data around that argument that you may be able to get from the public domain. The problems are how well does that match to your industry or your particular company? Uh, the best and most convincing data is always going to be in-house pilot projects, which goes back to the previous bullet. Um, you've got to somehow get build a motivation to do this in your company. And as soon as you get that buy-in to do a, a serious effort, maybe a week or several weeks with it, with an actual team greater than one, then it's uh, self-fulfilling. It's self-sustaining almost. You will continually be producing those arguments. Um, now, uh, another part of this is you've got to, part of getting buy-in is not just the motivation, but how you propose integrating STPA, and that affects whether you're going to get buy-in. There are four kind of maybe categories that I've seen that people have used. Number one is adding STPA as an N plus one process. That is not necessarily the, the best way. Number three seems to have had the most success, but I've seen companies successful in all four of these arguments. In case one, of course, the very first thing that's going to happen is someone will come out of the woodwork and say, we don't have money for that. We don't have budget for that. Even if it's the best method under the sun, uh, if you can argue people, if people already agree, people are still going to uh, reject based on the cost argument. Uh, so it depends on your culture. Um, it, there are some companies, uh, some in the nuclear industry, some in other industries, where um, the, the cost is not the primary motivation, where this is a strong uh, argument, even if it does increase cost. Case two, replace an existing process with STPA. If you can show that STPA does what we're always trying to do now, but does it uh, in maybe a, a better way, better could mean cheaper, could mean more effective, could mean some combination of things, um, that's another argument. Um, case, now I can't, 
without naming X, I can't tell you whether this is the best argument for you or not. Uh, so I'm just going to present it as an option. Case three, this might be the most effective, um, but it's not the only argument, is to show that the processes you're already doing are supported by STPA in a way that streamlines them. So you see six, seven, eight down there at the bottom. Those are now much quicker and easier to perform. We already had six, seven, and eight. We're not really adding a brand new process on top of six, seven, eight. We are finding a more efficient way to do that. This is a very effective argument if six, seven, eight involve requirements engineering, for example, for digital and software systems. You're already building requirements. What's an output of STPA is the requirements you need. Now, now the beauty of STPA is it's a really structured way to do that. that doesn't mean it's going to take more time. What it means sometimes is it takes less time because if you don't have STPA, how often do you revisit requirement number 6.1? Yeah, I've been on companies, large companies, where we revisit this over and over. Every month it seems like we're revisiting this requirement. Well, well that's time spent on the existing process. If we can visit it once and exactly once and have right in front of us all the trade-offs and be able to make a decision, uh, and if we go back to it a month from now, we can revisit the rationale for that decision because it's clearly documented, that's a win. That's streamlining a process you already have, not N plus one. So number three has been very effective in a lot of organizations. Another one is case four. Say we have all this time have been missing a process we didn't even know was required or was needed. Um, and, and that's been, uh, I don't know if I should name companies, but large companies have been successful with that kind of argument. When you've got buy-in, you've also got to learn the method. Now, there are all kinds of ways. We are row number two on this table now. And I've tried to evaluate these different mechanisms on four dimensions, cost, effort, scalability, and effectiveness. Scalability is about if you've got the large organizations, lots of people need to learn. Um, reading existing papers and uh, reports, of course, that's free. That's all out there. there been lots of, uh, go to our website. There have been lots of uh, links in the chat window. The effort, the effort needed may be higher because you've got to do all of your own homework and you've got to dig them up. Scalability is high because you can tell your entire organization to go read this paper. Effectiveness um, has been low on its own. Um, I would love to be able to say, here's a book I wrote that you can just read this book and everyone who reads it magically is, is an expert in the methodology. We have been unable to do that uh, for, for whatever reason. This is a method that you really need to practice to learn. But the cost is free. Now the workshop is free, it always has been, although uh, this is the first time it's been remote, so I may need to update this, this the last column there. Uh, well, the, the first column I already updated, but the scalability there needs to be updated. Now for the first time, uh, it's, it's very, very scalable. Anyone around the world who wants to can join in. Um, but attending this workshop on its own, I mean, it has a role, but by itself, it's not uh, it's not probably enough for you to be very successful with these techniques. If your company is one of the ones that is already using uh, Stamp, SDBA, or CAS, you could just participate in an existing project. There are a number of attendees that are in this situation, um, and it becomes self-sustaining in your organization. The cost there is low. Uh, this is a pretty good way to get involved. Um, but if you're not in that situation, what can you do? You've got to kickstart your process somehow, and the last four rows are a way to kickstart a brand new um, uh, uh, competency in your organization. Education classes are training. Now the cost is going up, but these are very, very effective. The next one, a dedicated project-based workshop where you spend a week or more on your own problem with someone who understands is an expert in SDPA. That's pr the most effective approach I've ever seen. Um, it's really a hands-on uh, learning that, that is at the core of this. Online education, which is being developed, um, may be able to bridge some of the gaps in, in the other rows in this table, but the effectiveness, we don't have data yet to know how effective they'll be. I suspect it's not as effective as in-person classes, uh, but that remains to be seen. Um, so learning the method, how do you go about this? One way to do this is to uh, have some type of class, but you, you need to, we're going to talk about, I'm not going to talk about the class here, but I want to talk about activities before and after a class so you can come up with a, a plan for success. Don't just show up for a class on day one. If you are going to, somebody knows what they're doing, they'll tell you the same thing. You need to do some preparation before you show up for a class. So you need to almost apply system engineering to uh, education. I did, before you show up, figure out what the goals are, what you're trying to get out of the class, what's the size of the group, what are the backgrounds of the folks who need to show up, who need to be there, if you have a class, but you don't have the right folks there, or you find out on day on the last day of the class, oh, I wish we had Fred here invited. He would have been really useful for the, to understand this method. That's too late. So you've got to come up with a training plan before the class. After the class, what do you do? You've got to have a plan in up front, I would say, to apply this immediately after the class. Don't wait for the class to finish to say, oh, now what are we going to apply this to? Lots of folks have spent a lot of money on classes and then dropped the ball uh, because they didn't have a project lined up to go apply it to. And a year later, you've forgotten what you learned in the class because no one's used any of it in a year. So don't repeat those mistakes. Have a plan before you even have a class um, developed and signed up for. 
lots of folks want to produce facilitators. We need to produce facilitators. Pr facilitators are the experts. Uh, uh, they not just can use it, but they can train and teach and coach others. Um, so this is really, this is harder. This is a higher bar to produce than just folks who understand the method and can do it. Um, to produce facilitators, you need to do more than test memorization. You need to know, um, you need to have skill, not just knowledge. Training is not enough to produce facilitators. That's something we have learned. You need successful experience on real projects and complex project problems. I've highlighted successful because we're in a world now where this is becoming a very popular approach. And we've got a number of folks who may not realize uh, 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 how close the results are really consistent with, with the handbook and the other materials that have been produced. So, so some folks might feel that they're successful. They might not be, of course, some folks know that they're not successful. So that's another problem. You've, you've got to have really successful um, projects that not just you think are successful, but really are compliant with, with SDP. We'll talk about this later. There are people who have applied it wrong and still found um, successful results, which is kind of interesting. They found value added from doing it, uh, from making a lot of mistakes. I mean, so maybe it's a step up even if you make mistakes, but ideally you shouldn't be making mistakes. What, what does it take? Uh, somewhere around one to two real projects, it seems, before you're able um, to start facilitating your own in-house um, applications. Now these have to be complex systems. You can't apply this to a thermostat and call that a, a complex real project. It's going to be a real system. Something on the order of months uh, might be a, about right. Um, and, and through that experience, you'll encounter lots of, of uh, um, uh, problems that you will have to solve. Um, and if you're able to solve those, you're probably on the right path to do that on project number three. The most successful strategy I've ever uh, been a part of is an apprenticeship strategy where you have someone with a lot of experience who really knows what they're doing. Uh, you have a project lined up, but you assign as part of the project team apprentices, potential folks who did really well um, in classes and education. And we call those uh, apprentices or potential future facilitators. We pick those out, uh, we assign them to the project. Their role is to kind of watch what the facilitator does, what the expert does. And after, um, sometimes after a few days, uh, they really start to pick up quick and they're able to take some of the load off of the expert facilitator and buy one to two projects, they are able to hit a home run. They can take a project and run with it. So lots of folks act, uh, ask about certification. We're working on a certification program. What we do typically uh, for, for low levels of certification is we, we certify that you attended a class, but you need more than that, uh, more than a, a certification of attendance. You need uh, higher levels of certification for facilitators. Um, here's something that really bothered me. Um, uh, someone emailed me and said, John, uh, we found the perfect facilitator. We just want to see run this by you and see if this makes sense to you. We found the perfect facilitator for this. We know that you're busy. I told him I, I'm too busy to, uh, to, to you know, work full time for months upon months. Um, and he said, we found somebody. Now, this person has decades of experience facilitating and performing fault tree analysis. They know how to facilitate. Unfortunately, they have no experience with STBA. They don't know what control structure is, what control actions are. I mean, they're below um, if folks have been attending this week. Um, but they're a facilitator, so we've, we've solved our problem. This is a subject matter expert for our applications. They don't just know fault trees, they know our application inside and out. Just give us a couple times, the, a couple days to bring them up to speed on the SDP methodology. I said, no, no. I mean, I, I, you may be able to bring them up to speed, but this is, you need a whole plan to do that. You're not gonna be able to give them a slide deck and say, now we've got an SDPA facilitator. Um, you need a, more than that. So, so don't fall into this trap. So there's a sequence of things you might consider after you become uh, educated. You need to uh, uh, maybe apply this to a project in three stages. There's a whole project, project planning phase I'll talk more about in a minute, but you need to select what project you're going to apply this to. You need to select the team you're going to apply it to. You need to plan for a schedule. I mean, don't shoot yourself in the foot by waiting until uh, you've taken a class to start asking these questions because you're going to end up delaying uh, all the things that you've learned and you're going to forget them. Have these things lined up and thought out ahead of time. This is system engineering applied to learning. Um, uh, figure out your goals up front and identify a plan to get you there. One way to do this is to plan a workshop. This could be a three to four day intensive experience where you have all of your ducks in a row for those three to four days. You have access to tap into the subject matter experts live if needed, and you spend those days to just plow through STPA uh, the, or possibly with CAS depending on your environment. It's not the only way to do it, but this is one way to do it. Um, it, it works if you've got limited access to uh, folks who know what they're doing. You don't finish the uh, application three to four days, but you can get a lot done in three to four days. And you take, you plan things. So in those three to four days, the parts that you tackle are selected not to give you 90% completion at the end of four days, but selected to give you a demonstration that your team can take 
uh, in the rest of the way in-house. So you have uncovered most of the barriers. You may look at a piece of automation during those four days. Also look at a piece that involves human operation, maybe in a control room or in a cockpit somewhere, and involve these different pieces of the puzzle so you can see the barriers and see how they get resolved uh, live. Um, and then you may need some, some kind of support phase. But this is just one way to approach it. But the point here is this, I didn't appreciate this until I, I started doing it. I used to, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I used to just tell people, um, go ahead, just, you know, what do you need? Here are the four steps, just go apply it to your system. Then I realized kind of the hard way, you really need to do a lot more planning than I thought up front if we'd like to give you the best chance for success. Another part of this is selecting a suitable system. Now, by the way, again, I'll, I'll say my same comment probably a few times. I, this is not intended to discourage anybody. If you're in a situation where you're the only one from your organization attending, um, you might be in a different situation. You might not have the resources and the buy-in to enable you to do this careful planning up front. In that case, maybe what you need to do is baby steps. Start with a mini version of this. What, how much of this can you do in a, in a couple of days uh, or in your spare time to build evidence and get support to do it the right way uh, for real in your organization. Uh, others, I know there are organizations that have sent uh, 50, possibly 100 folks to this workshop. Um, you may be in a, in a great position to, to start planning and working together uh, to do this right. Selecting a suitable system. Lots of folks have, have learned this the hard way too, so you don't have to repeat their mistakes. Here's an example. This is uh, from the US Air Force. Now they, uh, uh, again, they, they took some baby steps and they got to a point where they said, we're gonna do 10 uh, studies serious, fairly serious studies of STPA across four wings. The application here is for test safety. This is fantastic. A lot of organizations only have buy-in for one. Well, they, they have already done STPA before this point. This is part of the reason they got buy-in for 10 of them. So what they did is they did 10 of them, and here's the, the uh, end result. Nine of them were a fantastic success. One of them, uh, the leader of that one, they had different people installed, in, involved, not the same team for all these. The one is involved in the middle for one of them said it didn't work. Of course, they, I found out about this, and of course, my eyes are glued to the one who didn't work. I'm just so fixated on that one. Sometimes I got to step back and say, look, it, it, seven times it worked fantastically well with no uh, need for, for much help at all. Um, but I just can't stop looking at that case that didn't work. And you may be able to learn something from this case as well. So the first thing I did is, why, why did you conclude it didn't work? Uh, what, what happened? And the basis for this is, I'm only going to share quotes from the team. Um, uh, obviously, I've got my own view. I don't know. I don't think, I think you're going to buy the strongest arguments from the team themselves. So, so here's quotes from the team. The first uh, part of this is they said it produced similar results to our existing test safety process. Now, there's an argument you might raise. Personally, I uh, really insist on looking for results that you didn't have before. Um, but there's an argument here, is that a failure or is that a success? Because this may be the very first time in 20 years that um, anyone has carefully looked at this process. Or, you know, I'm making numbers up here, but it may be the first time in a long time that someone has really seriously um, looked at the existing process and had a, a point of comparison to say, are we covering our bases? If this, is, if this shows that for one application, which is what we're talking about, just one application that we did capture what we need, that has some value. Um, as, a, as a, a method to validate what we thought we knew but may not have been sure about. But let's go on. There's more to it than that. Um, I asked about the application. What did you apply it to? What, what was different about this than the other seven cases where, where you got a different answer? Well, the application was a simple familiar upgrade and it's something that they have been done, they have done many, many times before for decades. It was a small little delta, um, and STPA produced results. Basically, STPA showed the things they thought were important were, in fact, important. Um, all right, so that may be some uh, part of the lesson learned here. Um, if you apply STPA to a thermostat, think about a room and temperature thermostat, um, that's a control loop, right? It has a control structure. There are some losses. We get too hot and can't get our work done or lose something like that. Um, there are unsafe control actions, providing the heat command when the temperature is already too hot, right? The method can be applied, but are you gonna learn anything new? I don't know. I don't. There, this may not be the best method for a simple system with a very, very tight uh, boundary around it, around it. Let's go on. There's more to it from the, the folks on this team. STPA also found system design mitigations that existing test safety processes didn't. Well, that's interesting. Wait a minute. Can we really say it didn't work if we found all of these design mitigations that the engineering team and the test safety team never uh, identified before? Well, um, it, it, uh, the f I'm trying to give you um, not just my opinion, but the opinion of, of 
folks that may disagree with me, um, the argument here is, yeah, but John, we have no ability to influence the design in our organization because we don't have strong ties. Uh, if we discover something during our set taste, test the safety process, we may not be able to go back and change the design. All we can do is use it as is and try to build in our own uh, protections against it. Well, maybe we should reconsider that uh, conclusion and go back and say, we actually need, look, we've got a process that can uncover stuff we couldn't find before. Maybe we need that feedback to go back to the design team. And maybe we should involve the test safety team earlier when the design team is still making these decisions. Maybe this is the mechanism and the argument to get test safety involved earlier so that we can now have value added. And it's not, it's not just a discovery. Oh, look at this very new thing. The engineers never realized. Too bad we have to throw it out. Maybe that's not the way we should be approaching this. Um, maybe that's a lesson learned from, from an application like this. Um, STPA provided an easily understood model um, although it provided similar results, uh, they really latched on to the model and the approach that this took. So maybe there's value in this, even if it did produce similar results, because it's, it's very easy to understand. Um, and it was expected, this is a conclusion from the case where they say it didn't work, it was expected to be useful for new capabilities and complex systems. So maybe even if you find it doesn't work on one case, you can learn from that and identify exactly where it should be implemented. Another uh, conclusion from the team that did it is this aids in planning never before done tests. So remember, this was an application that had been done many, many times for decades, uh, possibly this type of thing. Uh, maybe where we will see the biggest value is something that we don't know the answer already, where it's never before been done. So these are some lessons learned. Don't go through the headache of applying it to this case when it's already been done, we can learn from their, um, from their trials. And again, this was one out of 10 that I, for some reason, just can't look away from. But maybe we should also remind ourselves the other seven were, didn't run into any of these troubles. Okay, selecting a suitable system is clearly important here. So let's learn a lesson here and look at complexity. This is what STPA was created for. Complexity makes STPA shine. The more complex the problem, the more powerful STPA will be to systems where there's opportunity to opportunity to be surprised. If you look at a room temperature thermostat, there's probably not a lot of opportunity there to be surprised, even though you can theoretically apply it. Uh, look for potential for unexpected behavior in your system that's going to surprise you, where there's unanticipated interactions that are going to occur. This is the, probably the best case for STPA. You should also think about uh, what is the criteria for calling this a success? Is it we have to find something new or is it? are there other criteria we might want to consider for success, like providing an easy to use method, providing new data points and new feedbacks in our process that don't yet exist, maybe to the design team or others. Um, identify, uh, if you've got a big complex system, where do you start? That raises a new question. Well, identify areas of concern, start there. We did a project with JAXA, the Japanese uh, organization analogous to NASA in the US um, on a spacecraft. And we said, well, where's the biggest area of concern? He said, well, there's the docking procedure where we dock with the International Space Station. That's where we can get loss of life. There are previous phases of correcting the orbit and launch and so on. Let's start with the high consequence problem of how we dock with the International Space Station. That's where they started STPA. That may be useful to you as well. Uh, choose systems where people aren't sure you've already addressed everything, not a system uh, where you think it's, it's simple and everyone feels like we've already uh, found everything that can go wrong. Uh, STPA is for functional analysis. You've got to choose a system where you can look at people or machines providing functions. If your system consists of purely fun physical phenomenon, like looking at material flammability, that's important for safety. There are safety folks who do that in their day job. M metal fatigue, that's another area of discipline of expertise and it's very important for safety. But if that's the scope of your problem, STPA probably isn't the best uh, technique to use. It's a tool in your tool belt, but th these techniques, we have other things like finite ev event simulation and things like that, element simulation, things like that. So it's probably not the best choice for purely physical phenomena. However, even for purely physical phenomena, the instant you expand your scope and say, wait a minute, maybe that's not really the boundary I should be looking at, you look at the bigger picture, STPA might be a fantastic choice for metal fatigue. We had a case with an airline with a five foot gash uh, during a commercial flight in their fuselage. And they looked and said, you know, there's a metal fatigue problem. There's a physical layer problem here, but you know what else? We have got a, a maintenance procedure. We've got inspections that were adjusted. We've got feedback that wasn't really suitable for identifying this case before it happened in the air. There are fantastic control loops that STPA is a great tool for. Um, and material flammability and, and uh, metal fatigue might fit in as a, a place where STP identifies as a scenario, as a high level scenario, and then you hand off to your metallurgy experts and say, all right, uh, we've identified this scenario. Can, do you have controls in place for this? What can we do? Uh, for, for fire, uh, flammability uh, and fire propagation, um, it's not going to simulate how fire you know, propagates in a forest in certain 
part of the season and so on. But if you've got a fire firefighting team, that, that's a fantastic um, bigger picture problem for, for STPA. Look at the people and teams of folks coordinating, providing control actions to try to handle the fire and so on. That fire propagation is embedded in the control structure um, and you will get scenarios for fire propagation, but it's, it's not going to provide a simulation tool for you, for example. So even for purely physical phenomena, STPA can capture them and can point you in the right direction. But let's not fool ourselves in thinking that it's, it's going to um, you know, do finite uh, element simulation and other uh, uh, finer points um, of uh, predict metal um, in, in fire propagation and your materials analysis and things like that. It's, it's, it's very good at what it does. So let's move on. Uh, assembling a team. Uh, you need an interdisciplinary team to do SDPA. Okay, you, you, the ideal case is not n equals one, one person doing this. Although in some startups, they're having a lot of, they have no choice and they've got a lot of success doing um, SDPA with one person who is the safety person for the whole organization. But um, ideally, you really should make use of an interdisciplinary team. Who's on your team? Well, I can't give you a fixed list. It depends on your application, but here are some examples. You may need a maintenance expert. You may need an, a regulations expert, an operator. Uh, I love bringing uh, supervisors and control room uh, trainers and, and things like supervisors and things like that. Um, uh, software experts. For pilots, it would, it would be uh, p instructor pilots because they've seen, they don't just fly and see the normal uh, routine every day. Um, they kind of, in their purview, uh, see the, the highlights of what could go wrong in the simulator. Testers. I love bringing in testers on the team, even if our application has nothing to do with testing. They bring a fantastic mindset to STPA. Their life is all about, give me something that's uh, been perfectly designed, uh, I'm going to break it. And that's the mindset you need with STPA, is no matter what you think the case may be, we're going to find a way to break it. That's what STPA is all about, building scenarios that, that you may have assumed are not even going to be possible. One of the people on your team has got to be an expert in the methodology. Every person on the team brings some expertise. You need someone who is an expert in the methodology. This is did not this idea did not originate in SDPA. Hazop is very big on this, and so are other methods. And Nancy and I looked at that and thought, well, this is probably true for SDPA as well. It's definitely true. In fact, I would say for SDPA as well. By the way, where do you identify the other experts up above and the, the bullet points there? Well, one way to do it is to draft or sketch out a control structure and use that to drive uh, the representatives on your team. If you've got uh, maintenance actions that are relevant for your control process, we ought to have someone who knows how, how has some experience or knows something about maintenance. So we need a facilitator on the team. That is true for other methods and it's true for STPA and I, I think for CAST as well. Um, you need someone who knows the method, someone who can support project planning, methodology guidance and expertise, help avoid common traps and pitfalls that people have made before you, uh, allocate analysis steps among the team members, aggregate the results someone asked about, parallel application of this across the team. It's very uh, uh, amenable to having a, a team, I mentioned a team of 40 people doing one STPA application, but you need a team leader. You need someone who knows STPA inside and out so you don't have people stepping on each other. Someone who's going to say, look, step one is not something we can have 50 people working on at the same time. We need to, uh, to come together with one answer for step one and probably a sketch of something for step two before we can divide it up into uh, multiple teams. So you, your facilitator will help guide you through all of these things. You need someone to review the analysis. Now, the facilitator is going to review from an STPA perspective. Are you compliant and consistent with the rules of STPA, which are there for a reason? But you need other people to look at it too. You need an operations expert to look at, is this consistent with how operations uh, is, is going to work? Is this reasonable or not uh, in what's missing? Um, personalities matter. So this is a little harder, a little more subjective and social part of this, but incredibly important. I've seen applications and attempts fail because of the wrong construction of the team. So you need uh, designers are, are ideal because they have the most knowledge. They've thought more about the system than anyone else, even, even before it's been designed. I'm talking about folks on your conceptual development team. They've thought more about what can go wrong sometimes than other people's, but the problem is they can get defensive and you've got to come about this really carefully um, because if they have already made decisions and you come at it as if you're questioning or challenging their decisions, not everybody is open to that. On the other hand, outsiders usually are not so touchy and sensitive about it because they're not the ones who made the decision, but they may have less knowledge about the system. So there's a trade-off here. Maybe if you can get a mix of these, it would be helpful. Maybe if you can use designers but find a strategy uh, to not make them defensive, there are a couple strategies you can use. One I, I already mentioned, you have to show them this is not a way to tell you you're wrong or to argue with you. It's a tool to help you uh, do your job, it, 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 and we're not trying 
trying to criticize or do a review, we're coming at it at, from an engineering perspective to make these decisions. It really helps if you do this early. If you come in after the decisions have been written down and set in stone, it's hard not to come across as if you're critiquing your design, as if you're a team member. But if you come out early before the decisions are even made, sometimes they're pulling their hair out about how to make decisions. Here's a tool, we can help you out. Here's how you can make a robust decision with traceability and rationale for the decision in a careful systematic way. They might love you for, for coming at it that way. That's been my experience. But this is, anyway, this is a trade-off that you've got to think about when planning your system. And, and of course, not everyone um, has the same perspective. Um, so it, I mean, you can't just put everyone in two buckets either. This is an oversimplification, but I've made my point here. It's a factor to consider. Um, uh, we really need open-minded people. I don't know a test that we can give people to label them as open-minded or not. I, I don't think that exists. But you know immediately, I think, what I'm talking about. People who are open to trying something new. There are folks that have been doing it a certain way for 20, 30, 40 years, and they may not be willing. They may be experts, they may be brilliant, but not able to, or not open to trying something uh, brand new. They might not be the best fit for the team, even if they know more than anyone else in your company. Um, you really need people who know, who are, who are motivated to try something new. Uh, one of the best experiences I had was on a team where we, we actually had to replace an, an expert who knew, knew more than anyone else in the company, uh, the chief engineer, um, but he, he, the nature of rising to that level is uh, for this person, they were very fixed in their ways. So uh, we, we thought it would be a good idea to include him, turned out to be a bad decision, had to replace him in the middle of the project. How did, who did we find in the middle of the project overnight to replace him? This is practically the intern in the company who didn't have a project to sign. Actually, I, I was very pessimistic about that decision, but turned out the best decision I ever made is to uh, get the, replace the chief engineer with the intern. I didn't think I'd ever be saying that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna qualify that in a second. That's, that's not something you should just say, John said we should replace, no. Um, I'm going to take that back in a second. But there is something to this. Um, that intern was open-minded, and the intern was not, you know, completely green, had some experience um, at, a, at another company, um, but that intern was very well motivated to kind of prove themselves, and they didn't have all the answers immediately, but you know what? They knew where to look to find the answers, and they could get an answer overnight, um, and it turned out to be a fantastic success, and the company has gone on to tell the world um, about the results they've gotten from a team uh, who ended up being led by this intern. So uh, I'm not saying you need to replace your chief engineers with interns or anything like that. I'm just telling you one experience on one project. There is a trade-off here, and it would be great if we can leverage um, uh, uh, both of these aspects. So don't, all I'm saying is don't be afraid um, uh, to look at more than just experience by itself, experience level. There are, there are multiple factors. We need systems thinkers who recognize the impact of indirect interactions. We need folks who, if you tell them you, that your problem is to design a uh, refueling algorithm, they're going to come back immediately and say, wait a minute, why are we even refueling the aircraft in the first place? That's the perfect person to be doing STPA. They balk almost at the blocks you put them in. Um, those are the systems thinkers. Um, we need people not afraid to dig deeper, say, wait, we've been doing this for 40 years, but you know what? This not the way we should be doing things. People are going to question long-held assumptions in your organization, shed light on systemic problems. And sometimes for, for some of these problems, sometimes less experience might help. That's not true across the board. I really hope no one takes this uh, the wrong way. I'm not pushing for um, saying experience doesn't matter. It's not important. I just assume everyone knows it does matter and it is important. And based on that assumption, I'm saying, well, there's, there's more to it than just that point. I hope that's clear. Um, you need a plan for STPA. The plan may go something like this. Feel free to copy and paste, but you need to think about a plan. Step one of the plan is not to do STPA. It's to identify why we're doing STPA. What are the goals of this project? Select an application for this a, a, a system that you're going to apply to. Select a team and prepare the team. Do some preliminary work. Then you start doing STPA, and then you uh, summarize the conclusions and key findings. Um, so you need to start with your goals. Now, this actually matters. I didn't think that it would have mattered you know, 10, 15 years ago when I was much more in an engineering mindset, not thinking much about management. Um, you, you really need to figure out why you, why you want to do STPA. Do you just want to demonstrate the technique for your organization? That's goal number one. That's very different from if you truly want to analyze a whole system from a safety perspective or security perspective. You're going to choose a different system. You're going to have a different strategy to achieve those two goals. Is your goal just to learn STPA? You don't maybe care about this particular uh, pilot application so much or, the, or demonstrating it. You want to learn it. You're going to choose a different system if that's your goal. Is your goal to provide comparison data? I'll tell you that is the most challenging goal out of all of these. I've been involved in lots of comparisons and, and 
you really have got to do your homework planning the project properly. Otherwise, I've seen people spend a year on a comparison project and at the end, the data is invalid and they had to throw it out because it had suffered from too many weaknesses to be valuable. They spent a huge amount of effort going in the wrong direction. They said, well, we wish we had someone to tell us about this early on. We could have saved all this money and done it right and, and been able to convince the skeptics. That's another problem. Um, you really need to, to, to plan this thing carefully if you're gonna have uh, not just something to convince you and me, but to convince all the skeptics in your organization. Figure out what your goals are and use that to drive all these decisions. It will drive who you invite to be on your team. It, you need to give them an, an overview, prepare them. Here's what I suggest. Before you seriously go through SDPA carefully, do a sketch of every step. Make no attempt to be complete. Make no attempt to be 100% accurate and correct. Just try to do a quick sketch, maybe a few hours, maybe a few days, because the goal is not to produce the actual results. The goal is to identify roadblocks before you get there, before you spend three months and say, you know what? I'm not gonna be, be able to identify any scenarios for these UCAs because I don't have access to the subject matter experts that I need. I thought I might be able to, but they're, they're blocking me and I, I wish I chose a different application. Don't wait three months to find that out. I do a quick sketch, figure out what, you're gonna, what information you're gonna need to have access to, Identify those roadblocks and experts and follow, bring them in early and, and you know, call, give them a five minute phone call and say, can you answer this question and, and give it a, a, a real kind of sketch, um, let's call it, um, it, to see if it's going to be successful or not, if you're going to be able to proceed, then do it for real. Now, after you do it and, and uh, find the results, you've got to follow up. There's going to be outstanding areas. There are going to be action items that you're going to have to uh, record and follow up on. You're going to need to uh, sign actions, uh, have activities. You're going to need to probably a lot of folks make assumptions when they're doing the analysis. That might be okay if you write them down and then follow up and, and check them. So make sure um, you're carefully documenting them and having uh, time in your schedule and so on to go verify those assumptions. Um, you need to incorporate new changes into your system. Don't just take the results and say, that was nice. You need to do something with them and review the results. Um, here's something to think about. Last step. You need to summarize the findings from your STPA project. Now, I, as a naive engineer, uh, initially, you, I thought the most important results from STPA might be the detailed technical requirements you get, the scenarios you get, and the, the specific uh, things we do to fix them. That's not necessarily the most important findings from STPA. Think about yourself embedded in a larger control loop as an STPA practitioner. Somebody gave you authorization and direction to go do STPA. That's a control action. What kind of feedback do you need to provide to that person, that decision maker in your system, to enable them to make better decisions later? They are wondering, did STPA work? Should I use it in the future? Where is this useful, if it's useful at all? What kind of feedback do they need to make that decision? It's not a spreadsheet with a thousand requirements that we found and identified, or five random scenarios we identified. What you need to do is craft a message for these managers and decision makers. And this is not an engineering message always, um, but the engineers have to make it um, if, if the engineers are doing the analysis, which may or may not be the case now that I think about it, depending on who you are and what your application is, but um, often it is the engineers. So here's what I suggest. As you're doing STPA, make it a point to record the aha moments. If you don't have any aha moments, you're doing STPA wrong. You need to identify them, write them down, and I record a separate file called the aha moments outside of the, the some, most of the deliveries of the project and I write them down as they happen. Here's the problem, trust me, if you wait three months or even a month and then you try to think back what were those lessons learned and craft the message after the fact, it is not gonna be possible. You're gonna forget what they are. You're gonna struggle to say, I remember there were five things all along, what were they? It is almost impossible to do this after the fact because they're only an aha moment for a few moments until you fix it and then it's, a, it's, a, it's a obvious. Then it's, it's, well, we all know that, we've known it for months. Um, you've got to record them as they happen because that is the basis a lot of times for the feedback back up to the decision maker said you could do this project you need to say you know what this this was a key revelation to us as we did stpa we probably wouldn't have realized this without the process like this and, and here's how um here's why this was useful so identify another output not just the aha moments but identify who else in your organization might benefit from this maybe it's not useful for you in this in a certain uh group that you're in but maybe it should be used by system engineers maybe it's useful for the cybersecurity folks if you're in the safety team you might say hey it's not just something the safety team should be used maybe it should be used by the, the folks who do concept development and others in your organization create a list i mean i can give you a list but you don't want the, the answer from me you want to produce the answer yourself within your own company and, and identify those other teams Make it part of your report up to the decision maker. Um, spread the word.
not just to the engineers who need to go fix this, um, but to the management who gave you authorization to do the project. So again, here's the template. I went through a, a few of these um, quickly. Uh, you've got to do some planning up front. Here's some examples that a, uh, a facilitator may need to, uh, of things a facilitator may need to uh, uh, ca capture to guide the analysis. Um, some comments I've gotten historically, this has never happened before. Why are we wasting our time on this UCA? Well, history is filled with accidents that have never happened prior to that. That's not a reason to ignore it in STPA, but sometimes it's, it's hard for people new to STPA to wrap their heads around it. The facilitator is kind of the, uh, the coach uh, to, to help the team understand why we're doing these things. We already have a mitigation in place for that UCA. If it ever does happen, it's never going to cause a, a problem because we've got four, five, ten backups in place. Well, again, history is filled of cases where all five or all ten of those backups were taken out by a common cause or even not by a common cause. Um, that's not a reason to ignore it. It's very easy to approach SDP with the wrong mindset to go. Even if you follow the four steps to the T, um, the, uh, according to the definitions of the terms and so on, if you've got, you can have the wrong mindset. It's for whatever reason, it's easy to fall into the trap of using STPA to try to prove the decision you already made are correct. That is totally the wrong mindset. This is an example of that. This, there is already a mitigation in place, so we can cross that off the list and we can say that it's already solved. That is not at all how you approach STPA. You might get that as a conclusion at the end, but you don't do that at all during the STPA process before you've made, made, that, made, that, uh, made that conclusion. Um, can this really happen? We already assumed it can't. Well, that's why we're doing this. We're trying to see if that's a good assumption or not. We already know about UCA. I actually haven't uh, uh, given me a, a, a revelation here, so let's just skip scenarios. We've known about it. We've discussed it for years. Well, you don't know if it's important until you identify the scenarios. I've got lots of cases where that has happened. The UCA is something everybody on the team has known about for years. It's been known about before prior operation of the previous version of the system. Um, but in STPA land, this exact same UCA has a brand new scenario nobody thought about. The system was designed, the new system was designed to trigger this UCA that always existed. Um, and we, but we didn't know we were putting a new cause in our system. This will never happen. All these things you have to respond to. Another common comment we've gotten this week. What about the failures? You're overlooking the most important part of the analysis or how do failures fit into the analysis. This comes oftentimes from folks that are familiar with a technique that starts with the failures. There are lots of failure-based techniques and in an STPA, notice step one didn't have any failures. In fact, it's a rule. You can't identify failures in step one. If you do, you're doing it wrong. You need system level hazards and stakeholder losses. Those are not component failures. Step two doesn't have failures. Step three usually doesn't reference failures. There are some exceptions, but we're talking about control actions. Uh, not failures. Step four, you have to go within step four a little bit until you get to the failures. And there's a reasons why we don't start with the failures. That's why STPA works as well as it does. But for new folks who've never seen it before, the common question is, wait a minute, we're in the middle of step four and I haven't seen a failure yet. How, how are you overlooking what I think is the most important part? So you've got to explain this to them and why this is designed that way and why it's worth um, worth your effort. Uh, should we assume X or Y? It comes up all the time when you're doing this under uncertainty, which is most of the time. A facilitator will help you figure out the, the proper assumption um, of when you're doing this debate. Do we write this down? The answer to that is always yes. Here's probably the most common question. This has come up again. Again, this is a rule that the facilitator on your team will help as your coach and your guide um, uh, during the process. So common question is how do you prioritize results? Here's my answer. Um, there are a whole series of answers that you will get. And it, the right answer probably depends on your project, which is why there's not a fixed single answer it baked into STPA. Now, uh, uh, I should point out, maybe some folks have criticized it. It said that STPA does not allow prioritizing the results. That is totally false. In fact, almost everyone using STPA is using one of the mechanisms on this slide to prioritize the results. Um, and there's some mention of that, but we, we we can't declare it only one way to prioritize because it, it may depend. But here are some answers, some ways to do it. The first, and I think often the most powerful answer is this. Many results actually don't require prioritization. These are the no-brainers. If you haven't done SDPA seriously before, this you may have to do it to realize this. Um, if you are coming from the mindset of doing a traditional risk assessment, severity times probability, if that's your livelihood, and that's how your brain thinks about the problem, this is going to take more than I can cover in a couple minutes to, to show you a different way of thinking. But there are so many results that you just put on the slide or on the screen, you say, why am I, I wouldn't even bother putting a probability on this or putting a ranking on this. This is a no brainer. The cost is zero. You don't have to do any assessment to know the cost is zero. The requirement is something we need, we want, we have to have to achieve our goal and it's missing right now. That's a no brainer. The, the, the effort you would take to prioritize that is literally longer than just fixing the problem. It takes two seconds sometimes to fix these problems that you get with STPA. These are the no brainers. You need, a, a, even if you have a prioritization scheme, I strongly recommend you build into your process a bypass mechanism for these no brainers. And you know what? These no brainers are usually the strongest results from the whole project. You'll get some stuff that you may want to prioritize, but these 
are, if you look back at the end of the project, these are the ones that are the most value added sometimes. Now, that said, there are some results that you may need to prioritize. Sometimes just because there's so many of them and you don't know um, if it's, if it's, uh, if you need to, if, if you don't know relatively how important it is. So, Severity. Everybody already uses severity. There's no reason not to use it for STPA. In fact, just about everybody using STPA, I think, has some notion of severity built in. In STPA step one, you identify losses. Every example I've ever done has losses um, grouped in different levels of severity. Uh, loss of life clearly is a different severity than a uh, loss of uh, production mission or something to that effect. Now, every result in STPA, every requirement UCA scenario is linked back to those losses. That means the uh, results are automatically grouped and prioritized by severity in STPA land. But you can do more more than severity. There's nothing telling you you only have to do severity. There's effectiveness and strength of the controls. Now, probability causes a problem. The probability is not going to appear in this list. The reason is because only some of the things you get in SDPA uh, may have any argument about probability for them. The ones that do, by the way, you might have a wrong argument. You might have the wrong probability in mind. That's another problem. But there are uh, results from STPA that go beyond probability. That's why probability is not a universal answer. I wish it was. It would be easy. We could make a red-green uh, management chart for all of the answers on this. Uh, but I uh, it's, I'm sorry, but the, the world is the way it is. Probability is not universally applicable to the things STPA funds. Effectiveness and strength of controls might be. Severity is. So we can use them. What about frequency? Uh, I, I regret already mentioning probability. I just opened another can of worms. We've opened it previously, so I don't feel too bad. But um, I, aside from the probability argument, here are other measures that you may want to consider. Frequency of a causal factor across scenarios. Now, frequency here does not mean probability. What it means is when you identify scenarios, you may find, you will find, um, some causal factors show up all the time, are common causes across multiple scenarios. You may want to prioritize those common causes. If you've got one causal factor that can cause every single scenario you identify, well, hey, you might want to prioritize preventing and controlling that causal factor over the guy that only causes one of the scenarios. Um, how many UCAs and scenarios does this requirement prevent or mitigate? This is baked into the process as is. Every single requirement from SDPA is traceable to one or more UCAs and scenarios, and you can use that as an input to ranking the requirements if the data is already produced by STPA. Another example is a controllability measure. Now, this is not perfect. None of these, by the way, are perfect on their own, but these are some, some uh, measures you may use. Controllability is not, the advantage of this measure is it's already baked into a standard. Oh, shoot, I forgot to add a slide showing this. You'll, you'll have to go to Appendix A on your own or give me a minute to pull it up. But Appendix A in MIL standard 882 already proposes this. In the body of this MIL standard, you have the traditional risk matrix probability and severity. We're, most of you are probably familiar with that. But guess what? The authors realize that that doesn't always apply so well to software, specifically the probability dimension. The authors of the standard realize this. Now, they didn't document so clearly what their thinking was, but they were right on the money with this. So they propose in Appendix A to replace the standard risk matrix, to replace probability and likelihood with a controllability measure for software-related problems. And this is very clearly outlined in Appendix A. Go look it up. You, the advantage here is you don't have to say John Thomas said X. This is already in your standard. I believe it's in A, B, C, D, E, and the future versions. It's in all of them, as far as I, could, uh, uh, as far as I recall. Um, almost positive on that. I started in, in A and all the way back to the original. So the authors knew what they were talking about. They, 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 this, was, this was one of the good things about the uh, standard. So there's an, there are other measures. You may look at the capacity to detect and recover from these scenarios. Uh, an example of that is uh, something that's been, what GM has proposed is something called immediately hazardous. How quickly is an intervention, if this scenario happens, uh, how quickly would you have to intervene to prevent a loss? Well, if this thing is going, to, if you've got to respond within a second to detect and recover and, and intervene, that's maybe a higher priority than something that leads to the same loss, but you've got a day or an hour to intervene. So you can use that. Um, and there are ways to develop a Pareto chart. So these, and there are more than what's on this list. We want this to be flexible and not say bullet point number one is the answer for everyone in every industry across the board. Remember this, a lot of you are used to using standards tailored for your industry. STPA is not designed for only one industry. It is cross industry and international um, as well. So you, you can look at these measures to develop a, a, um, ways to prioritize depending on your situation. Now let's look at a couple examples. You might look at, this, has been a, this is, exact problem has been a popular topic for presentation in this annual workshop. Here is one presentation you might look at. This is by folks at General Motors. Here's the name and the year to go look. The slides are on the website. They show how to develop through a series of two filters to, uh, in the second filter, develop a Pareto to prioritize uh, which scenarios and which requirements are most important.
important in your application. There's no reason you can't do this for your own application. Here's another one. This is by Boeing a year after GM proposed it. I think this has, has a lot of similarities to what uh, GM proposed, but it's, it's got a lot of differences as well. Um, this is using SDPA trend analysis to determine key system drivers. If you've got a big monitor, you can read the percentages. Basically what they're saying on this slide is, look at this guy, I think the biggest one is 34%. That's the biggest driver. So let's target that guy as a number one priority. And then we'll look at the other smaller contributing factors. Look at these presentations for more details um, if you want to see how companies have been doing this. But it is totally wrong to say SDPA um, does not um, prioritize your results. Uh, it, at a minimum, it's severity and, uh, and it, you can go far beyond that if you like. All right, I'm sorry, I just had to get that off, off, off uh, uh, get that out there because it's a it's a common question. But the point is, your facilitator will help guide your team in your industry and in your company through these kinds of questions and develop a solution for you. Um, next, let's talk about management. You need to think about management's role in an STPA analysis. STPA is going to encourage high impact, long term solutions. So it's not just going to say, "Here's your five software requirements that you are missing." It's going to say, "Here's a bunch of software requirements, but also you." got some management issues that you might want to deal with because um, you, you never want to look just at software. It'll say your operators in your system are going to be using your software in a different way. You need to deal with the procedures you give the, the operators and so on. It's going to encourage these long-term solutions. And these may be things that you've been doing for 20 or 30 years. So what do you do? You don't want to be in a situation where you have to throw out the most important results from SDPA because you don't have management on board. It really helps to find managers who want these proposals, not just want to try something new, but are open to uh, getting these solutions that are going to be very, very effective, but require changing how your company operates, um, not just temporary or superficial recommendations. Um, here, how do we get there? Well, we need to share. That's a big part of what this workshop is all about. At not just MIT, MIT is very pro sharing. Um, but outside MIT, uh, in the remaining two weeks of the workshop, starting on Monday, you're going to hear from folks in the industry who have gotten permission to share what they've been finding with STPA. Now, we need to encourage this. Uh, we've, and here's a problem. I, in fact, what I'm going to do, I haven't been doing uh, polls. I apologize for that. I'm going to open the first poll right now. Maybe you can help me solve this problem. Here's the problem. There are a lot of companies that Nancy and I personally know have incredibly strong arguments, quantitative and otherwise, for doing STPA. They've done it, and the problem is it's been so successful at the company that they see it as a competitive advantage. As soon as this high-level executive sees the answer, they say, I cannot believe it. This is... We have got to put a cap on this and prevent this from being published openly. And we're going to use this as a competitive advantage before our peers start catching on and using SDPA for these benefits. So there's a secrecy, secrecy problem. The only way I've been able to try to argue people out of this is by saying there's an alternative. The alternative, and this has been successful, but, but only for some companies. We we want, our, we want to be recognized as a leader. Here's where this happened. There was a, a company who uh, was incredibly successful in STPA and said, um, we want to share with the world. And I said, why? Why don't you suffer from the secrecy kind of culture? Or it, why isn't that your gut reaction? And they said, because our goal is actually um, not just have a competitive advantage, but we want the rest of the industry, particularly when it comes to safety, we want the rest of the industry to name our company and say they were first. Here's the presentation or the data that they, where they were the first, and you can look at the, the time of release and so on. We want everyone to follow our lead. Um, and recognize us. It's, so it's, it's almost an, an advertisement or, um, or, or a, a culture and a reputational issue, uh, which overpowered the secrecy uh, advantage that they saw. So I, this is a, gets to the culture of an organization. I don't know if there's a way to encourage this in other organizations or if there's another argument we can use to get folks on board. But we really, I think, um, I'm really passionate about this. We have got to find a way to get more uh, industry folks to release their data. I'm, I'm telling you, there's some strong data out there. There are orders of magnitude stronger data that I have seen, but it, I, I am unable to talk about. Um, so help me find a way to get this, get this out there. All right, we're nearing the end of this presentation. I'm not gonna take the, uh, the whole hour and a half, I think, so we'll have time for questions and we might actually have time for a break. We'll see, um, an actual break. Um, let's look at data. I love data. 
Um, the, the, some people, certain arguments I make, people think I'm anti-data. No, I, I used to live that life. I, I love data, but I'm a stickler for using it properly and not violating the assumptions that make statistics and probability and other things work. So here's some data that I've collected. Um, this is from four projects that I was heavily involved in. These are industry-led projects. I can't name them, there's secrecy problems here, um, but I've got permission to release these pie charts. And I was curious, during the course of the project, what portion of time do you spend on different activities? These are STPA projects. So, here's the first one. Out of the entire effort spent on the project, the total number of hours spent, 73% of the whole time was spent on behalf of the team learning how the system they're gonna study actually works. 16% was spent actually doing the four steps of STPA, and 11% were going and hunting down answers to questions that were raised by STPA but had never, ever been raised before on the project, um, which, is, which is a bonus. Now, this is interesting. What can we get out of this, this pie chart? This surprised me when I saw it. I thought that 16% would be much bigger. I was honestly expecting something like 75%. Certainly, the majority of an STPA project, you would think, would be spent applying STPA, right? Not the case. Um, turns out, uh, to do STPA, of course, you've got to learn something about the system. Now, this doesn't imply the system's fully designed. In fact, none of these projects came in truly at the end when the system was fully designed. Um, there are a variety of different phases, um, but even if you have a concept um, of your system, there are lots of questions about uh, how that concept is, is conceived, um, how it's going to interface with things in the environment, and so on. So learning about that uh, consumed a large part of the this, this system. Now, if you think about it, what does this say about STPA? Um, this says, STPA is kind of, I guess, it appears it's a streamlined process. I mean, you have to learn how the system or how the concept works no matter what. If you're gonna, if you're gonna do an analysis, you've gotta understand how the thing works. There's no avoiding that. If you've got a method that actually avoids that step, you've got a bad method and you, and you shouldn't trust it at all. So this is, says something about the overhead involved in doing STPA. Whatever, how does this compare to, how's this overlap with processes you've are, you're already doing today? That 73% you're already doing. So if you want to do STPA, what are you actually adding? It's that 16% that might actually be different or in addition to what you're doing today. It's a very low overhead, it appears. That 11%, that might be more time. In fact, I think we can all agree that's more time than what you might, doing, might be doing without STPA. But how much of that is value added? Do you really want to put your head in the sand and ignore that 11% of questions? Or is it worth, is it adding value to be exploring these things? This is something that a pilot study will give you answers to. You don't have to trust John Thomas from previous experiences experiences maybe in a different industry, you can do a pilot study to investigate these things for yourself. But I'll show you three others and you'll see some patterns. Here's another application, different company, different industry, different team. Learning how the system, system works 50%, learning STPA 10%, applying STPA 11%, finding answers to questions raised 29%. Whoa, look at this. Again, one pattern we see, learning how the system works is the dominant factor in an STPA analysis. That's unavoidable no matter what method you use. 10% was spent learning STPA. It doesn't take too long uh, to learn STPA. Now, you need more than an hour, that's true, uh, but it doesn't take months. Um, applying STPA was only 11% of the project here. Again, it, it seems to be a pattern. Very, very low. Um, I don't know if you want to call this overhead or not. It's really the core of the process, but it's very low in addition to whatever method you're going to use. You, if you're using a method, you're going to have to get folks uh, trained and educated, even if it's a method you've used for 30 years. You've, you, people don't live forever. You've got turnover. You've got to have a, a training program in place. So the really, really the only additional piece is that 11% plus maybe the 29%, which I think is, is useful. Um, there's another one, 45% is learning how the system works, 50% is applying STPA. And this one was an interesting case because the solutions here were not no-brainers. I mean, it, it, fixing the problem was a no-brainer, uh, uh, but how to actually fix it, this one was much later in the project development um, cycle, and it was real hard to figure out how to actually address these scenarios that late in the program. But it was so clear uh, that they had to be addressed that they spent a significant amount of time figuring that out. Um, here's the last one. This is, you can see I started to collect more and more information as we went on. 53% um, learning how the system works, applying STPA here was only 5% of the whole STPA project. And identifying solutions, this was another late application, um, was a little bit harder. The ones on the left, the solutions were zero time. It's not that they weren't collected at all. It was that they were done fairly early uh, in development and it was, it was so easy. It would have taken more time to debate the solution than just putting it in place. 
um, there was no very little rework involved on the left-hand side. So, all right, so th this is the data. This may be useful to you, I don't know, but it's something to think about. Uh, I collected another data. I wanted to see what the actual learning curve looked like. We've heard that term, uh, but a lot of us might not have seen what it actually looks like. Here's the actual literal learning curve for STPA. And I did this for two parts of STPA. Now, part step one and step two of STPA are generally very, very quick. Um, if you've been uh, properly educated, you could sketch it out in minutes usually. Um, now, I, I need to qualify all of these blanket statements I'm making. I shouldn't be making blanket statements like that because the control structure is a living model. You need to add to it, it iterates, it grows, and so on. So I, I can't really make that statement. But relative to step three and four, control structure usually is much quicker. So on this project, step three is, is the first time dump. And I measured for the same team the first time they had to identify the, uh, a similar size UCA table, the second, third, and fourth. And what you see is 55 minutes immediately dropped down to 20 something just by doing it on a real project. Then it dropped down to 20, uh, low 20s and then under 20 on the fourth application. This, what you're seeing is learning and things are clicking in their minds, how STPA works, how to construct an STPA. I'll tell you, I've done STPA and UCAs so many times, I practically dream about UCAs at this point. It, you, you flash a system in front of me and I'm already seeing the UCAs and you will too, um, the more you use STPA. So this, so you need to keep this in mind. If one of your goals for your STPA project is to evaluate how much time it takes, you need to be real careful about understanding how the learning curve works. The very first project you get is gonna be about three times longer than after you've done SDPA for a while. If your team is similar to this team, which may or may not be true, but so you may get three times, you may have two times, you may have more than that, uh, four or five times. Um, but this is for step, step three. In any case, it's not valid to say our first application is representative of the amount of time it's gonna take. It's always gonna be longer and probably significantly longer because of the learning component. It gets even more exaggerated for step four. Out of all four steps, step four is usually the biggest time um, uh, time allocation, let's say. Um, so I measured this across 18 for six, uh, uh, six uh, how do I phrase this? Um, six, they did it six times uh, on different uh, representatively similar applications. And on the first one, developing scenarios, uh, what took 80 something minutes uh, to complete that. Um, and this is for within some system boundary, of course. Um, you can't say it's gonna take me 80 minutes on mine because your, your boundary may be much larger or smaller. And this wasn't the whole SDPA application. This was just within one month what I could measure. So it took them for, let's, let's frame this as for a controller of similar complexity. The first time they found all these scenarios in 80 something minutes. The second time, 60 something minutes. The third time, 20 something, the teens, and then just uh, under 10 uh, minutes on application five, and then it bounced back up a bit on the sixth application. Look at this reduction in time, about an eight-fold reduction for this team from the first to the fifth and sixth. They really figured out what was going. They got a rhythm. Um, they're now probably in a good uh, place to start uh, doing STPA and guiding future applications of STPA. But you can see um, the time on first application is not at all representative of what you're going to be seeing as you uh, build up steam in your organization. So keep that in mind if your goal is to measure time. You've, you, if that really is your goal, you need the resources to do multiple applications. All right, so that was the presentation.